basically the six basic teachings of the Christian faith as taught in uh, Luther's catechism. We're going to be going through those. So um, each one of them demonstrates God's love in, in a powerful way, and we're going to start that next week. But if you've been with us for the last six weeks, you know that we've already been through all five stages of grief, and so what are we going to do today? Well, today we're going to talk about how in Christ we have something that those who grieve without Christ don't have, and that is the assurance of eternal life for those who die in the faith, which brings then to us, those who have lost loved ones, a peace and a joy that uh, you can only find in Christ. But Pastor Tony talked about the final stage last Sunday, which was acceptance, but I want to talk about how acceptance and peace might be two different things, maybe how they're different. I just want to, I want to throw that out to you and let you talk about that for a minute. Uh, in, in this service, we have um, opportunity to uh, discuss uh, certain points of the message, and feel free to share as much as you like at your table, or just sit back and listen to what the other people have to say. But I want you to chew on this question. What is the difference between acceptance and peace, especially as it relates to the, to the grieving process? Let's take about two minutes to do that now. take it just a few more seconds and uh, finish up our discussion on this one. You know, somebody asked me uh, why during Easter we're talking about death and grieving, and um, the reason I gave them was because uh, there just seems to be a lot of our Trinity family recently who are dealing with loss and loss of family members and um, spouses, and, and uh, you know, we thought 
you know, this would be a good time to kind of walk people through that, that healing process. And just talking at our table, you know, I'm reminded of, of how many of us recently have, have lost people that are close to us. And, um, you know, the, all the more reason why um, it's important to, to remind ourselves that acceptance and peace are different things. Because you can come to accept a passing but not have a peace about it. And it's also important to know where that peace comes from. The peace comes from, from God in knowing uh, his gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Um, I just want to remind you, too, that Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians, Brothers and sisters, do not grieve like the rest of mankind who has no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Paul's urging us, don't grieve like those people who don't have hope, because we do. We have the hope of the cross and the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus. And this is why we're talking about this at Easter time, because the empty tomb is a picture to us of that peace and joy that only we can have in the passing of someone who we love. You know, I think uh, kids understand this even better than adults do, um, uh, I was I was uh, shared a story in early service and my wife just reminded me of another story But the the story that I shared in the early service was um, I did a funeral for a man who was in his late 20s uh, He had a, a bad back injury and then he accidentally overdosed on uh, on pain pills that he had been prescribed for his back injury and um, And I was doing the funeral for him and he had a little boy that was probably seven or eight years old and on the way out of the funeral you know, I bent down to him and I said, um, you know, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? And, and his exact words to me were, I'm doing okay because my daddy is with Jesus. And, um, you know, he's doing okay. And why? Because he has that peace that only comes through knowing Christ. Now, was he sad about his dad being gone? Absolutely. Was he grieving his passing? Absolutely. But he knew where his dad was. It was the resurrection of Christ and the promise of resurrection for his dad that brought him to that final stage of grief that only Christians experience, and that is, is peace. So, um, you know, I just want to also kind of walk through... Uh, oh, the other example, actually, that my, my wife just reminded me of is um, when we were in ministry at uh, Marco Island, and my wife was the youth minister there, there was a, a girl who started uh, coming to church because her mom wanted her to uh, just have socialization. She wanted her to have a, a network of friends, and she thought, you know, church would be a good place to do that. The mom was, was very, uh, you know, clear about her beliefs. She didn't believe in Jesus at all. Um, but the daughter then, uh, as she grew up in the Sunday school system and as she was introduced to God and she began seeing God at work in her life, she was confirmed and then baptized on the same day when she was in seventh grade. And, um, and then uh, the, uh, her grandfather, the, the woman that brought her uh, father, passed away. And she was really a wreck, but she looked at her daughter and noticed that she was sad, but she had something that she didn't. She had an assurance and, and a hope in, in Christ that she didn't have. And so then it was through watching her daughter grieve in a different way than her that she finally came to faith also and was baptized. So it was, it was a beautiful way that God worked through that. But, um, and it just highlights then those who grieve with no hope and those who grieve with the hope of Christ. And there's lots of examples in Scripture of how Jesus intercedes, interjects into the grieving process and brings about that joy and peace that only he can give. Uh, the first example that I want to give is um, when Jesus raises a widow's son in Luke chapter 7. This is, uh, takes place outside the city of Nain. It's the only time that that city is mentioned uh, in the Bible, but it's still a city today in Jerusalem, uh, or in uh, Israel, rather. It's on the um, east side of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, it was uh, the, re the place of the resurrection and the, and the widow's house was actually turned into a church in the first century, and it's still there today. So it's a, it's a neat thing to go and see. But uh, Jesus is walking up to the city of Nain, and there's a big gate outside the city, and, and there was a funeral procession that was coming out to a, a burial spot. And there was a bunch of people that were crying and, and grieving, understandably, the, the loss of, of this uh, young man. And Jesus sees this coming, and the text says that he has compassion on this widow. Now, the, the widow, of course 
lost her son, but even more than that, she lost the only person who could care for her in her old age. She was a widow, which means she'd already lost her husband, and this was her only child and only son who was to take care of her. And so Jesus came to her and said these words, Don't cry. Now, why would he tell this woman not to cry? Here she is in this uh, terrible situation, having lost her son and lost the person who, who cares for her. And uh, then Jesus goes on to, um, to explain or to show why he tells her not to cry. And he leans over and he says, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Grief in this case ended up in peace and in joy because of resurrection in Jesus Christ. That he really interrupted the grieving process with eternal life. And so then, of course, the, the woman's, uh, the widow's grieving experience was uh, drastically changed because of, of this um, life that she had given, that Jesus had given her son. So the second um, example of this that I want to uh, tell you about was when Jesus raises, his, uh, raises Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. You know, the Sea of Galilee is um, uh, sort of in the middle, uh, uh, upper middle of Jerusalem area, and Jesus' ministry takes place around that sea for the most part, and he's traveling back and forth across it a number of times uh, because sometimes the crowds would get overwhelming and he would go to a new place and, and do ministry there for a while. I can think of uh, one time that um, he crosses the Sea of Galilee. It was actually the famous storm where Peter walks on water, that story. And he gets to the other side, and then he's, he's there in a new place where he's um, able to do a couple miracles. He heals a man from uh, demon possession. And then, and then um, if you remember, all the, the pigs uh, got, ran into the ocean, and they asked him to leave at that point. They said, you know, we could tell that you're a powerful guy, and you're a little scary, so please go away, is what they told him. And so he went back over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee where there was actually a crowd of people still waiting for him um, to uh, heal their sick and, and uh, raise their dead and just uh, comfort them. And so there was a man named Jairus who was there waiting for Jesus back on the other side. And he came to Jesus and he said, Please, um, my 12-year-old daughter is very sick and I need you to come to my house and, and heal her. So Jesus uh, said he would do that, and he had compassion on Jairus. And as they're walking towards the house, Jairus' servant came out to him and said, your daughter has passed away. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And so, of course, he was, he was upset, and he was grieving, and Jesus said these words to him. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Why would Jesus tell him this? He just lost his daughter. He's obviously very upset. But then Jesus again shows him why, and he takes uh, Jairus to the house, and he goes in with just the, the parents and a couple of the disciples, and he sees the 12-year-old the girl there. And the text says, He took her by the hand and said, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. Why did he tell him, don't be afraid? Because of the resurrection that Jesus brings. Because in his grieving process, Jesus interjected with joy and peace of eternal life. So again, his grief ended in peace. And then, of course, probably the most famous story was uh, Jesus when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was the, the brother of Martha, and uh, he had been dead in the tomb for a couple days, and Lazarus um, Lazarus had been in the tomb for a couple days, and Jesus came finally to the tomb, and Martha comes up to him and says, uh, Jesus, my, my brother has died, um, but I know now that God will, ev will give you whatever you ask for. So in other words, she's saying, you know, if, if you'd have been here, he probably wouldn't have died, but I still know that whatever you ask for, God will give you. And so uh, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So then Jesus goes to the tomb and he says, uh, Lazarus, in a loud voice, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, Take off the grave cloths and let him go. 
once again, grief turned into peace and joy because of the resurrection that Jesus brings. Now, in each of these cases, we are told that, that the people who are suffering with loss were grieving, but we don't get a, a detailed picture into them walking through these five steps of grief, which again are um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. But in the case of Jesus' death, we actually get to see the disciples enter each of these stages. If you look at the text, you can find where the disciples go through all five of these steps. Let me give you just an example. You know, um, Jesus is trying to prepare these disciples for his, his crucifixion and his death. And uh, just like maybe somebody who was dying of, of cancer or something would want to prepare their family, and, and they begin to go through the, the five stages even before the person is dead and um, and so Peter then says to Jesus the first step this will never happen to you denial right he says this will never happen to you he is of course in denial about Jesus's uh, crucifixion so then um, then if you uh, fast forward to when Jesus was arrested in the garden Peter's reaction was anger the second stage he pulls out his sword and he cuts the servant's ear off right and Jesus then heals the man's ear, and he says, Peter, we're not here to, to lead a, um, a, uh, or a uh, insurrection or, or, a, or a rebellion. Uh, so then, you know, Peter um, lets him be arrested. But you can see then that Peter is, is definitely angry. Then uh, if you go to John, uh, the book of John, Jesus is there talking to his disciples, and he's trying to comfort them. He knows that his crucifixion is coming. He knows that there's going to be this death and this separation between him and them. And so he's trying to prepare them, and he says, Listen, my father's house has many rooms, and if this wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you that. So I am going ahead of you then to prepare a place for you. And when I come back, I will take you that you can be with me in that room that I have prepared. And he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And then you can see Thomas and Philip go through this stage of bargaining at this point. And Thomas says, well, we don't know the way, so how can we know where you're going? And Jesus says, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. So Jesus is trying to comfort them in his eventual passing. And, and the disciples are bargaining with him a little bit. And then... Uh, uh, Philip says, well, show us the Father, Jesus. If you can show us the Father who you're speaking about, then that will be enough for us. Those were his, his words. If you show us the Father, that will be enough for us. He's, he's trying to bargain. He's saying, if you really want to comfort us, you really want us to believe this promise that you're giving us, show us the Father, and then, and then we'll believe. Then we'll be comforted. And Jesus tells him, well, you have seen me, and so you have also seen the Father. And I am the way and the truth and the life. So, um, so there, here they are bargaining with Jesus uh, as part of their grieving process. And then finally, uh, it, after Jesus is crucified and he's in the tomb, you can see them kind of go through this period of depression, right? Uh, Mary's at the tomb. She's crying, and she gets the, she's trying to prepare Jesus for his final burial. She still doesn't understand the whole resurrection thing yet. And she gets there, and the tomb is empty. And you can kind of read between the lines here. She's like, ah, oh, you know, we just lost Jesus to the cross, and now we've lost his body. I mean, just tell me where he is. So then she turns to somebody who she thinks is the gardener behind her, and she says, just listen, tell me where Jesus' body is, please. If you have taken him, tell me where I can find him. And uh, then, of course, it wasn't the gardener. It was, in fact, Jesus. And, and he says, Mary, why are you crying? And she wraps her arms around him and gives him a big hug, and she says, um, he says, go back and tell the disciples that I have, uh, I have been raised from the dead. So um, when she goes back, of course, all the rest of the disciples are kind of in this period of depression, too. They've locked themselves all together in the upper room, kind of just wallowing in their, their own uh, uh, sadness and grief and depression. And then they, they hear this news that Jesus is risen from the dead, and they don't quite know what to make of it. And then Jesus then appears to them in this room. And do you remember what he, what he said to them? He said, peace be with you. So in both Mary's case and the disciples' case, their grieving was cut short by the peace and joy of the resurrection. He gave them the peace of God which surpasses understanding. 
in their hearts and minds. So, now our loved ones and us, we're really no different in terms of our experience of death as far as um, what Jesus experienced. That in, in those cases when we die in the faith, we receive the same resurrection. Now, if you fast forward then to when Jesus ascended into heaven, it was uh, 40 days later in the book of Acts, the disciples are all there, and Jesus says to them, I am ascending to my Father, and he goes, and he's, he's gone, he's away from them, he's in heaven. And uh, there, interestingly enough, there was no grieving by the disciples at that point. So the first time when they thought he was dead, they, they were grieving, going through the five steps, but when he ascended into heaven and they knew that he was alive, and they knew that he had resurrected, and they, he was in heaven with God, no grieving. Because they had that peace and joy knowing where he was. And so then if we have that same assurance that our loved ones and also us have the promise of eternal life and we know that they are in fact alive even though temporarily separated from us, then we too will have peace and joy that only comes through knowing Christ. Now certainly it is okay to grieve the loss of someone who we love. Even if we have the assurance that our separation is only temporary, it hurts to be gone from that person for, for that amount of time. So everyone needs to go through those, those five steps. But remember what Paul says. Do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. For we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ for all who put their faith in him. And so then, uh, for those of us who are grieving a loss in our lives, I just want to offer you a blessing. May the peace that surpasses understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we, we thank you that even in the midst of great loss and grief, that you have given us the assurance of your Son, that in his death and resurrection in the empty tomb, we have a promise for those who have faith in you that you will take them to be with you, that you have prepared a room in your Father's house for them. We ask that you would remind us of that so we can have the peace that surpasses understanding and the joy that only you can give. Lord God, we also ask for your healing mercies and your assurance to all those among us who are facing surgery, recovering from surgery, or recovering from cancer. We pray that you would guide them and remind them of your promises of eternity and your eternal healing as well. But also we ask that you would restore them to health, that they might continue the work that you have called them to do. We especially ask this for Sam Berger, who is facing surgery this week. We pray that you would uh, watch over him and, and guide him and bless the doctors and the nurses, that they would uh, that they would grant him the care that he needs. Lord God, we um, also pray that you would be with the Caliendo family at the loss of Lynette's brother. We pray that you would uh, grant them peace and joy even in the midst of their grief because of your assurance of eternal life. And we ask that you would help each and every one of us here be a source of strength and encouragement to those around us who are suffering grief, that we might be your voice of assurance and hope to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask you to stand at this time, and um, we're going to pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. And in this prayer, again, is the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.